Hello, I'm here with Stephen Maxwell, world-renowned fitness coach and martial arts instructor, uh, holder the, the first American to ever get a black belt from the Gracies, and the first American to be certified to teach BJJ in America. That is true. Not, not the first American to get a black belt, however. The first American to be certified by the yeah, Gracie by the Gracie family to actually teach their family martial art. Uh, but I was Helsing Gracie's first American black belt, okay. and maybe one of the first uh, ten guys. I was very early in, on in the, in uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu in the United States. So. Oh, okay, uh, one of the first guys from the United States to ever get a black belt. Uh, you, you're quite famous for your um, fitness training. You have trained many fighters. Uh, like um, Saulo Ribeiro, um, Diego Sanchez, right? Yep, uh, Sanji Ribeiro. San, uh, Sanji Ribeiro. Guy, uh, you know, Cron Gracie, uh, of course my son, Zach Maxwell. Uh, a lot of um, lesser known people that were world champions at lower belt levels, blue and purple and so forth. Jen Petrina, who was a world champion uh, uh, woman, trained with me. Uh, I also worked uh, for brief periods of time with um, Kyoto Gracie, Mm -hmm. um, Hages Lebre, who was uh, my son's coach, uh, but you know the list goes on and on. So you so you have worked with a lot of high level athletes. Very very fortunate to have had the experience of working with these high level guys. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, Stephen is both. What what is interesting about Stephen is he's not just a fitness coach. He's not just a conditioning coach and a fitness coach. He's also a fighter. He has fought. For his entire life in the disciplines of wrestling, freestyle wrestling, right? Yeah, well, it's actually folk style wrestling. Folk style it's, wrestling. it's a it's a style uh, specific to the United States, uh, may, maybe Canada, but it's it's a very complete wrestling style. And many many of the UFC champions, that was their primary discipline. If you ever notice, uh, the guys that really make it big in mixed martial arts always are masters of one particular discipline. The guys that go in that are not particularly good in any one thing usually are never champion. You never see it. The guys that are really dominating now, of course, are the American wrestlers. Um, it's just such a good basis for, for mixed martial arts. But, of course, the big three disciplines, you must know kickboxing in some way. You must know Brazilian jiu-jitsu on the ground or you know, you're not going to last too long in that game. So, you know, the big three disciplines, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and some type of stand-up kickboxing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems like the wrestlers, they, they have such a hard work ethic and they just really know how to push themselves and high pain threshold. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's for sure. Wrestlers uh, are dominating. Um, so you yourself have competed in wrestling. Then you switched to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and grappling, and you have also won many medals in BJJ, right? Yes, in the age group divisions. Um, after my collegiate wrestling career, I coached for a couple of years and uh, did some some uh, wrestling on the side. But you know, there's no real way, especially back then, back in the '70s and the '80s, to make any kind of money from wrestling. You know, it's only been within recent times that you could really, you know, make a living with, with wrestling. And uh, I was just always looking for that, that thing to fill the spot, you know, that was left when I left wrestling. And I tried all sorts of stand-up styles. And it wasn't in my nature. I, I'm, I'm a grappler. I want to grab and grapple and wrestle and get things down to the floor if I can. It's just in my nature. You know, some people are strikers by nature. Some people aren't. And... Uh, I was always looking for that thing that in my life that was kind of missing. And then when I discovered Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it was like, wow, this is like 1989. But I had 38 years at that point, so I wasn't like a kid, you know. I mean, I was a mature man, but it was a love affair from first sight, and I just devoted myself to trying to learn this particular martial art. So, yeah, 1989, before anyone even knew what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was. 1989. What's interesting for me, and maybe you can uh, shed some light on this subject uh, since you started then. Uh, remember when the movie Lethal Weapon came out? Yes. Mel Gibson choked the guy out in this movie, in the first part, with a triangle choke. He did. And when I, uh, look, when I looked at um, a fight choreographer, who, who was the fight choreographer? It, it, it was one of the Gracies. And I'm like, how can this be? Uh, they became famous in 1993 when the first UFC came out. 
not. But the movie was made, I think, uh, 89, 1991, something like that, before the first UFC. So I- I'm not sure how, uh, how he was able to get the job of being a fight choreographer in a, you know, in a movie of such, uh, you know, importance. Not importance, magnitude. I can tell you that. Yeah, please uh, do. The guy, his name was Jorge and Gracie. Okay. He was the oldest son of Elio Gracie. Elio Gracie is credited with uh, adapting Japanese style jiu-jitsu into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The, the first Gracie to learn it, of course, was Carlos Gracie. He, he is the true father of, of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But the, guy, the, the younger brother of Carlos was the one that seemed to have the, the highest level of skill, but yet he was the smallest. So Elio, his oldest son, Horia, moved to California and got a job in the bit parts in the movie industry. He uh, got a uh, actor's card, and he used to play like on Starsky and Hutch. They'd, they'd always cast him in the role of like an Arab guy because mm-hmm. he was very dark looking, or some you know he played an Indian or something. I think it was one of the stories I heard. And um, once it was discovered that he he knew this really awesome uh, style, uh, he was asked. Uh, to go in the set and teach uh, this particular martial art. And he, um, he he taught Mel Gibson a few tricks. And uh, Rene Russo, do you remember when she did that shoulder throw against the bad guy? Mm-hmm. That was... Hor- That's the sec- second part, right? Yes, but that was Horan Gracie that she throws through the glass door. Okay. She couldn't throw any of the stuntmen because she didn't quite have the base or the balance. Mm-hmm. And, of course, and he was a master making himself light. Mm-hmm. He could make you look like a world champion because yeah. he, he literally would throw himself through the air light as a feather and he can make even just like a beginner look like wow yeah. and that is like a really cool you know he, he actually jumped in there and had a, a small little appearance in that particular movie that's nice I, di- I didn't know this I didn't know this so uh, so you've been around the sport for a long time you're both a, a fitness educator you're, you're both a fitness coach You've trained uh, many people from uh, serious athletes, from uh, high-level athletes to low, lower-level level athletes, and you trained also regular people, right? Well, I got my start as a uh, health and physical education teacher in the public school system. I graduated from the School of uh, Health and Physical Education in Westchester. At that time, it was a state teacher's college. Um, they developed teaching teachers for the schools. And... Um, I knew from the, when I was a young boy that I wanted to be in phys, physical education in one way or another. And um, the uh, it was a short jump from working with children and so forth to working with adults. Around that time, the, the Nautilus movement, the high-intensity training with Arthur, Arthur Jones, uh, became really big. Up to that time, of course, it was all uh, barbell training. But the machines kind of revolutionized the way people thought about uh, training and fitness, uh, especially Jones with his newfangled Nautilus machines. So I was kind of on the ground floor. And I started working at a Nautilus club, the first one actually in Pennsylvania at that time. Might have been like one of one or two on the eastern seaboard of the United States, so very early on. And um, it was uh, it was interesting. I, I kind of shifted then to working more and more with, with adults. And that Nautilus gym was like a who's who of like really big-time athletes in the eastern you know, the East Coast, especially uh, people around the Philadelphia area, like all sorts of professional athletes and, you know, high-level amateur athletes. A lot, of, a lot of really top people came through that particular club. Mm-hmm. So you're very well known in the, in the fitness world. You have a, a lot of products online. Uh, you, you also train baseball players, right? Uh, one in particular, his name was David Bell, a very good baseball player. Uh, he played for the Phillies, but before that with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, baseball, uh, to the European fans, is really popular game in the United States. Um, and the guys make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. They play 164 games in a season. That's a lot of games, sometimes two or even three in one week. And the guys' bodies take a terrible beating. So uh, I worked with Dave trying to get his his uh, his uh, body balanced out because he, he, he was suffered a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. He had a lot of uh, injuries. The, the guys have a lot of overuse stuff, so I was busy balancing him and trying to get uh, the imbalances corrected. 